<laughs> I'd like to call a meeting of the January 15th City Council meeting to order. Uh, we'd like to start with a roll call, please. Councilmember Brownstone. Present. Councilmember Reddick. Here. Councilmember Penrose. Here. Vice Mayor Eisen. Here. Mayor Rarbeck. Here. You have a quorum. I'd like to welcome our latest member of the City Council, Robert Brownstone, who was recently elected. The, the two Debbies are continuing on, and Adam is also uh, the Vice Mayor now. So it's uh, going to be an interesting year. I'm excited to be the Mayor. It's a lot of work, but uh, I hope to serve the community. Um, those of you who followed City Council meetings realize that the order of the uh, agenda is slightly different. That was my doing. We're going to start with public forum. That's people talking about any item not on the agenda. Um, I always thought that was the most important part of City Council meetings. And by having it first, if you so choose, you can give your two-minute spiel and leave. Uh, I encourage you to stay, but you, you have that option. Um, I have only, only 26 speakers on public forum. So uh, we're, oh, we have to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Sorry, OK. Uh, I'm new at this. So let's do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> As I was saying, we have 26 speaker cards for uh, items not on the agenda. So normally we have three minutes uh, per speaker, but uh, I don't want to go home after midnight tonight. So we're going to uh, limit the speakers to two minutes each. Um, the first speaker is Helen Walter, followed by uh, Amber Stowe. Press the button. Good evening, Mayor Rarbeck and council members. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Helen Walter, and I am with the Committee for Green Foothills. CGF is a nonprofit that works to protect open spaces, farmlands, and natural resources in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. We have a longstanding interest in Half Moon Bay. We are here tonight on behalf of our members and the broader Half Moon Bay community concerning the Surf Beach, Dunes Beach, planned development area. As you know, a pre-development proposal for this site was submitted to the city in late 2016. There was an immediate strong reaction by the community against the proposal. CGF decided to step in to assist the community it, with a coordinated p petition to illustrate the community's stance on this issue. When we began this ish effort, I knew that the community opposed the project, but in 20 years, 20 plus years of community organizing, I've never seen or experienced such widespread community interest and overwhelming opposition to a project in six short weeks, we collected 4,680 signatures, of which 1,887 were from Half Moon Bay residents. That's more than one in 10 of your residents, according to census data. Approximately 1,300 more were from the surrounding communities, El Granada, Montero, Moss Beach, and Pacifica. The, act, the total number is actually higher because many of the signatures were illegible. Respectfully, I am submitting 297 pages, <coughs> excuse me, of petition. 
half of which them from an online effort, while a huge number were gathered in person here on the coast, particularly by John Lynch. I'm going to skip most of my talk, but we recognize that this proposal has a long way to go in the decision-making process. I do hope that once it is agendized, that each of you will remember the huge number of people who support the protection of this land. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, uh, Amber Stowe, followed by Lenny Roberts. I just want to start by saying Happy New Year and thank you for listening to our concerns about Dunes Beach. And I'm very glad to see everyone here who braved the weather. Uh, for the record, can everyone who is here tonight to save Dunes Beach please stand up? <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, I had um, the pleasure of driving down to Southern California and back this past weekend for a family event, and you know, we are very truly lucky to call this state our home. And I think the saying is true that there is no spring that's greener than a California winter. <laughs> um, my only hope is that we can preserve that greenery for this and future generations. Uh, one of my stops was in Grover Beach, um, which was, when I was a girl, a very small community called Grover City, ironically. Um, as my husband and I were driving down, we got a call from the people we would be staying with, and they said, oh, um, call us after you pass Avila Beach, because you will very likely run into some heavy traffic. And I'm thinking to myself, Avila Beach? Avila Beach, that's, you know, this little tiny blink and you miss it coastal community. And as I got past there and we got into the expected traffic and then out again, I thought this is, this could potentially be our future here. The entire bluff side of Pismo is covered in hotels, almost to the point where um, subtle coastal access signs are the only indication that the public can actually touch the sand. We do not want that here. And half of the people who signed that petition are from out of town, and they don't want this development either. So I think it kind of behooves you to think in terms of that. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, Lenny Roberts followed by John Lynch. Good evening, and I want to say congratulations to the, your new council member and new mayor and new vice mayor for starting on a good year. So I'm Lenny Roberts. I've been the legislative advocate for Committee for Green Foothills for 40 years, and have, we've had a long-standing, as Helen said, a long-standing interest in Half Moon Bay. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone here that there have been two prior proposals for a hotel at um, Surf Beach and Dunes Beach. Uh, one was in a hotel, a Hilton hotel in 1998, and then that was withdrawn because of public opposition. Then two, uh, two years later, there was another attempt uh, at another hotel, which was supposed to be a very green hotel, um, and that was also withdrawn because of public opposition. So I think the public has a, very long history of seeing this site as something that should has special characteristics, needs to be protected. Uh, the reason that we have the snowy plover on all of the signs is that the snowy plover nests on the beach just north of Surf Beach and Dunes Beach at Roosevelt Beach. So the more people that are attracted to stay there with uh, lots of other amenities there, I think that that poses a threat to that particular shorebird. Uh, so I want to also pay homage to the champion signature gatherer <laughs> of all time. He is the linchpin of all 
efforts to bring citizen concerns to the city. And that's John Lynch. Here he is on his scooter uh, getting signatures. He has a couple of words to say, and I just want to say thank you. If everybody in this world had John's energy and civic responsibility, it would certainly be a better place. Thank you, Lenny. John? Followed by Mike Ferreira. Give me a short and quick. Since I retired 30 years ago, I have obtained many, many thousands of signatures on 28 advisory petitions, initiatives, referendums, and recalls. My latest petition actively has been to save Dunes Beach from being developed with a 200-room hotel and 170 RV parking spaces on Ocean View land just west of Highway 1 at Dunes Beach. Using my scooter, and let me show you a picture of the scooter she gave me. It was easy to obtain more than 2,200 signatures to save Dunes Beach. It was one of the easiest signature activities I ever involved. Why? People don't want to see the land of Dunes Beach despoiled. Please do whatever you can, ne never let this project be developed. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Mike Ferreira, followed by Greg Virgilito. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Rarbach and council members. Um, I now live in the Midcoast, and I do want to say that the opposition in the Midcoast is, unbelievably so, much stronger than even in the city of Half Moon Bay. That's because they look at that section of the highway and they say, you can't do that there. That's a heavily traveled corridor. It's already congested. There is no mitigation that you could come up with that would fix it. To go back into history, when the Ocean Colony Hotel was being built, it had the oversight of the, not just the city, but the Coastal Commission. And it still came out that on the very first day of operation, Highway 1 and 92 jammed. And it was actually fortunate that we had an enlightened management there that would change the shift change hours of the hotel to get away from that jam. We then found that in spite of the Coastal Commission's oversight, there was no parking for employees. And the city had to do the only annexation in its history to create a big parking lot for employees. We also found that we didn't have enough parking for special events, and so we had to allow parking in fire zones, et cetera, et cetera. Council Member Ruddick remembers all this because we had to go through it all. And there was not a problem of the Ritz because they weren't the developers of the hotel. It was the Monga and Richards group that did all of that. Uh, it put Lenny in the position of actually having to support an annexation to Half Moon Bay. And <laughs> not a pleasant memory for her. So traffic is a serious issue. I don't see how you can fix it. Something else needs to be done there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Greg, followed by Ed Lorenis. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the council for your faithful service and let you know that I'm here tonight representing the collective voice of not only my Miramar West counterparts, but also the thousands of citizens on the coast side who are also against the proposed development at Dunes Beach.
Back in June, I wrote a letter to the commission. In that letter, I pointed out how I felt that the character of this town, its natural resources, and our quality of life were being threatened by this project and others in the works. I also mentioned that I felt that the direction we seemed to be heading was contrary to what the majority wanted, which had a lot of us feeling disillusioned and betrayed. I closed by professing my unconditional love for this town, though, and this community, and that I have been, that I have been a part of for 30 plus years. Then I decided to stop the whining and get involved. And now I will get to my point. Since that time, I've attended meetings, engaged in a lot of great phone and email correspondence, and talked with commissioners, council members, and many in this room. And what I have come to find is that I am surrounded by a lot of like-minded people that are thoughtful and passionate. And it is my perception that there is a genuine concerted effort by our city officials to do right by the citizens of this town. And I find that admirable. In addition, I've taken careful notice as to what my options are and what the general discourse has been surrounding not only this project, but our town's future. I am pleased to know that there are opportunities to be involved, that there is transparency, and I am happy to hear ideas and vocabulary being thrown around, such as visual resources and scenic qualities, view shed, soft buffers, eclectic charming character, and endangered species habitat, or ESH. Final paragraph. Most important to me, though, is that there is this acknowledgement that our infrastructure does, in fact, need work. The data shows that we certainly don't need any more hotels or RV parks, that our resources and quality of life need to be protected, and that we do, in fact, have a rare and beautiful gem that is worth protecting. But it starts with saving Dunes Beach from any development. All eyes are on us. How this proposal is handled, I believe, will set the pace and course of direction that will ultimately determine the future of our town. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Greg. Ed Lorraine is followed by John Clausen. I'm going to be quick. I agree with everything that's been said, and I want to congratulate you all. I'm, I think I'm going to love this city council. <laughs> thank you for serving. I'm, I'm very happy you're there. And I'd like to thank the community, because I believe this is what happens when some developer proposes a project that just has no redeeming qualities. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, John Clausen, followed by Maria De DePunzo. I hope I pronounced that right. Hello, and thank you, uh, Mayor and, and City Council members. My name is John Clausen. I am the chair of um, San Mateo County Surfrider Foundation, the chapter here in San Mateo County, and I'm very proud and excited to be here representing our o over 500 active members and uh, hundreds of volunteers who are committed to the protection and enjoyment of our amazing ocean the waves, the beaches, and more than 50 miles of coastline uh, on the Pacific here in, in uh, San Mateo County. Like many of the other organizations and people here, we are opposed to the Dunes Beach development. Um, it is the wrong decision for the coast side for many important reasons, many that have already been raised, worth repeating. It will negatively impact sensitive habitats. Uh, it will reduce agriculture and equestrian land use here in the coast side. It will minimize recreation and access for the public. It will undoubtedly worsen traffic congestion along Highway 1. It will block incredible views, and let's be clear, these are some of our most important assets in the coast side. And it will simply, and is simply, not aligned, I believe, with Half Moon Bay's uh, coastal policies or the land use plan. It is certainly not appropriate here at Dunes Beach. Our community does not want this development, and I think that's clear. This community has shown up tonight. We have these petitions, and I think this is just the beginning. And so we respectfully ask uh, that you, and not just you, but all of us, but especially you in your, in your capacity, um, dismiss the notion of such a development in any way that you can. So thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Maria DePunzo. 
followed by Courtney Pazin. Hi, my name is Maria de Punzio, and I'm a resident of Half Moon Bay, uh, particularly the Frenchman's Creek neighborhood. Haven't lived there as much as um, as long as some of the uh, some of the others have lived there, but long enough to really appreciate the beautiful nature of our coastline and the opportunities to recreate and the views from the highway, which you know, all would be impacted by a development of this nature with the number of rooms and the number of RV parking spots. So I just wanted to echo all the concerns of the people that spoke before me and, uh, and come out in opposition of this development and hope that um, you will all join us in opposing this development in your capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Courtney Pazin, followed by Edwin Ferrin. Good evening. Um, I wanted to thank the Coastside Land Trust, Green Foothills, and Surf Rider Foundation for your support of Protecting Dunes. My name is Courtney Pazin. City Council, you may remember me from the Planner Commission's meeting when this informal proposal of the Dunes Project was first publicly discussed. I personally would like to know why our city council even entertains projects that are clearly detrimental to our habitats. I'm also asking for LCP amendments for future developments. I'm not sure what the point is of having a, basically a coastal constitution if no one is upholding it and overlooking what it explicitly states is appropriate for the land surrounding dunes. Our coastline is diverse and delicate. Our land is scarce. We should be entertaining projects that support our coastside communities, our seniors, our teachers, our low-income families, and our special needs, if the land does need development on it. We don't need to be encouraging tour tourism that we cannot sustain, and quite frankly, we don't need as a city. Protect what you love and keep defending dunes. Thank you. Ed Theron, followed by Paul Gregorius. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank you all for your service, first of all. I know you're in a tough position at times up there. Um, I'm feeling really good tonight because I see all these people here. I see all this activism here. And it's a clear message about the type of type of community we want on the coast, not just Half Moon Bay, but El Granada. I live in El Granada, Moss Beach, Montero. There's a character, there's a feel to this place that can get easily chipped away by one big wave after the other. So I, I hope you will not only work hard to stop this, but go a step further and, and look pro proactively at other, other uh, vulnerable open spaces that may somebody's going to come in and swoop and seize dollar signs around. So thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you, Edwin. <laughs> Paul Gregorio, followed by Brent Turner. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this is not dunes related. Should I hold it for a little while? Brent is the last one on my list who seems to be Dunes related. Let's so let him proceed yeah, to be that. Sounds good. <laughs> What's this? He does that every time I go to speak anywhere, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Hello, good counsel. My name is Brent Turner. I uh, have to disclose um, that I am a Frenchman's Creek resident, and I walk that territory every day, as a lot of people here do. I don't think there's much that needs to be said that hasn't already been said, other than I think we should put an exponent of 10 for intensity regarding this particular issue. If you polled like John Lynch does or went out and took signatures, I think this would be a good issue. I think he could probably get millions of signatures saying that this is a horrible idea for all kinds of reasons which have already been mentioned. 
what I guess is only left to be said is that there is such a pride in this room and such a great feeling. I was irritated I had to be here tonight and that we're under attack again and again and again. But now that I'm here and I see the great people in this room and the community we have, I'm really proud and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Uh, Paul, Paul, stay, Paul, stay there. I lied. There is one more Dunes Beach, Surf Beach uh, comment from Mary Lorenis. Hang on, I gotta get fixed up here. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, members of the public. I am Chari Adresis, Nivosis, <laughs> but you can just call me a Western Snowy Plover. I am between 5.9 and 6.6 .6 inches long, and I weigh 1.2 to 2 ounces. I only live about three years. I eat bugs, live in sand dunes, make a shallow nest, lay an egg or two, and hope for the best. I'm also endangered, and the feds have put me on, a list, on the list as threatened. I heard there may only be 3,000 of us left on the Pacific coast. So why is this? Because of habitat degradation caused by human disturbance, urban development, introduction of non-native plants, and expanding predator populations like your doggies and your kitties. The trash you leave on the beach near my home also brings in raccoons. Ooh, I hate raccoons. All of these things have resulted in my decline. I can't find food, I can't nest, I can't have youngins or find a mate. Some very well-meaning humans are trying to help me at Dunes Beach, but some other humans are planning on building a hotel, RV lot, a spa, what the heck is a spa? In other words, create massive human disturbance near my dwindling home site. I haven't got a chance. Please help me and my species. Do not support the Dunes Hotel and RV Park. Thank you. Thank you, Snowy. Um, now, Paul Gregoriev, I got a card that says recycle bins is the topic. There's no name on it, so whoever is interested in recycle bins, please, after Paul. Okay, good evening. Uh, I am Paul Gregoriev, and I live here in Half Moon Bay. And I have oh. quick comments about two problems I think need your attention, neither of which is doing speech. Uh, the first problem popped up again this past weekend when over a two-day period, it appeared that thousands of co-siders lost their telephone and internet service due to, a down, due to downed wires near the intersection of Poplar and Highway 1. It was amazing to me that more than 80 people, 8-0, went on next door to express their frustrations over this outage and over the length of time that service providers took to repair it. The outage seems to have affected the full length of the coast side, and many folks reported that their service was out for 20 hours or more. Well, what's also bad is that the loss of service like this seems to be happening more and more often, and individual customers feel victimized. As a response, I'd like to see the city try to get to the bottom of what's been going on in these incidents and put some pressure on the service providers to develop redundant network solutions in a faster, more effective way of responding to outages as they occur. Uh, my second problem has to do with how hard it is to be able to hear our local officials when we attend the meetings uh, of our city council, not so much, and various commissions like the planning commission. Uh, a case in point would be last Tuesday's planning commission meeting where, try as they might, Neither the planning commissioners nor the audience members could seem to be consistently heard over the city's microphone system. The problem seems to relate 
to the pickup elements in the city's mics, which are different in the Planning Commission than the one I'm speaking into here. Uh, they have go ahead, almost go done. Ahead, go ahead. Uh, they have an extremely narrow and highly directional zone of sensitivity. If a speaker isn't within about two inches of the mic, unlike this one, uh, and doesn't speak directly into it, then he or she isn't picked up at all by the system. Staff have tried to solve this problem by briefing the users, but it seems like the problem will continue until better equipment is tested and put to work. Perhaps you could take a look at this. Uh, that's what I have tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, Bob, uh, would you care to comment on either of these issues if you feel so moved? Sure, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and, and Mr. Gregoria. Uh, yes, we are aware of the, uh, of the internet um, down. I, I didn't know the full extent, so it was interesting to hear from the speaker how extensive it was and reports that it was um, up to 20 hours for some people. Um, so we're um, talking about it internally, and our next step is to set up meetings with the providers and do exactly what the speaker suggests, find out what we can find out, get to the bottom of it and see if there are possible solutions to make this situation better. Um, we don't know, but we'll look into it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Tim Pond, followed by Jochen Stein. Is this, uh, this is on. Um, my name's Tim Pond, and I'd like to point out that there are plastic particles in all of our bodies, in our food, in the animals, in the soil around us, and it's become a point, it's got to a point where it's inescapable. And yet we have these bins on all our streets that say recycled plastic, and it's a lie. Most of this plastic does not get recycled. It gets shipped off to other countries. And I would like the city council to look at a single-use plastic ban, or at least charging restaurants that have single-use plastic takeout items a fee to discourage the use of such items. You know, we're talking about a hotel here and we have catastrophic uh, environmental issues before us that point towards, in many cases, an end of what could be our civilization within 100 years or 150 years. And I appreciate the people that have come here to speak against that um, hotel up there. And I certainly agree that it's not the place for a hotel on the coast side. There are places where people should be able to come and visit this coast side that we have. And I, as a 30-year resident, I don't think that's the one of them. But I really would hope that I'm going to start an initiative and try to put an initiative on the ballot to uh, have a fee for single-use plastics coming out of restaurants. And uh, thank you for your time. Tim, I want to thank you for that and tell you that you have 100% of my support on it. Joachim Stein, followed by uh, Eric Harger. Uh, it's Jotham Stein, 534 five, Alsace Lorraine. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm uh, actually signed Mr. Lynn's petition out in front of the uh, farmer's market, but I'm here to talk to you today about another beach, Poplar Beach. Uh, on uh, December 31st, last day of the year, I walked with a friend. I figured maybe after the meetings in December, it might be cleaned up in some way. I thought, okay, let's try it. Walk down Poplar uh, entrance, walk to the Miramontes Cut. The beach was strewn with horse manure. I walked, walked up the Miramontes Cut. It had fresh horse manure on it. The next day, New Year's, I went uh, to go for a swim. So I negotiated down threw the horse manure, went into the water. At this point, I didn't have any shoes on, so I came up the cut that the public has newly created to get away from this problem and to cause inadvertently erosion on the beach. What's the purpose of me coming here today? One, to inform the council that nothing has gotten any better since the December meetings. Number two, I would like the council to explore the possibility of returning to what it used to be before the rains of September 2016, which is those horses did not go down the Miramontes Cut, they walked straight across and went down the Poplar Beach Cut. It was changed 
because uh, I was told that someone believed there was erosion in Poplar Beach entrance and therefore they allowed the horses to go down the Miramontes entrance. Third, I would like the council to consider going into executive session to ask the great lawyer that it has hired and its great law firm about whether the current contract is being breached. I've gone over that before, I won't, I won't raise the issue again. Why would you want to enforce the current contract? Well, first, uh, it's the right thing to do for the people. Second, uh, it shows strength from the community. It shows strength from the council. So when you negotiate the new contract, you have an ability to do that. Third, it shows strength with respect to everybody who's going to be negotiating with the city, including what I understand to be the aggressive developer who wants to build Dunes Beach and f uh, build on Dunes Beach. If you have strength, people listen, especially people in business who are motivated to make money. Finally, um, I, I urge the council, I know it's probably working on this issue, there's a tremendous amount of erosion on the beaches from Poplar Beach all the way to uh, where the Ritz is. Where people go down on the beach and sit, they create um, 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 paths that weren't there even three to six months ago. I regularly run that, run that portion and there's more and more erosion. Now, I know there's a significant problem with natural erosion. This is people-oriented erosion that I think the council should expedite the process of review about how to deal with those issues. Thank you very much for your time. Happy New Year. and. Uh, um, I look forward to uh, the council doing something on these issues. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Joe. Eric Harger, followed by Kirk Reamer. Well, Mayor, city, city council members, thank you guys for having me here. I'm Eric Harger, 20-year uh, Coastside resident, live here in Half Moon Bay, uh, raised my kids here. And I'm here to ask you guys for something that is widely needed um, the community is definitely in support of this. Uh, I'm working with the team here, uh, the Friends of Happening Bay Parks and Rec, to raise money to replace the swimming pool at the high school. So um, if you guys don't know, the pool was built 50 years ago. Maybe we had 200 residents in Half Moon Bay, more than that, I know. <laughs> but it was adequate at the time. But now the swim team nor the water polo teams can actually practice there or actually host tournaments there. The water polo teams have to drive over the hill to CSM to actually practice because the, the pool is not deep enough for them to even practice their sport. Uh, they can't host meets. They have to do it all over the hill. It's kind of a burden on the parents. But aside from that, the community members here, there's a wide berth of community members who actually want to use a pool, and they feel the burden of having to drive over the hill to CSM because the high school pool is just inadequate. It's too small. And during school hours, there's a bunch of issues. So um, what I'd like to do is request that you guys place a uh, replacement of the high school pool on your upcoming budget and start thinking of that. This is not going to be dumped all in your lap, thank goodness. Uh, there's a, a trifecta here we're working on. We're working with the school district. Uh, we're working on getting plans up and running so we know the costs. So we're not there yet, but I'm getting the ball rolling here with you guys. Uh, second, we're looking at the uh, county. And then we'd like to, to ask you folks for support and money for the project as well. And then on the back end of this, we are working personally to create an endowment so that there's money that's always there at some point to help keep the pool going. So in rough economic times when money's a little bit tighter, we'll have money to keep that thing up and running. So I want to get the ball rolling here. I want you guys to start thinking about this, get this on the budget. We'd fully appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Kirk Reamer, followed by Zachary Turner, who is our last public comment speaker. Good evening. I just wanted to echo um, Eric's comments. He really covered the full uh, spread of the intention, we hope, of the city to work with the school district and the county as needed to bring about a much better community-serving swimming pool. It's been a long time coming. This is the time to work on such a project and there is a large group of citizens, city and coastside that are in support of this project and are actively working on realistic mechanisms for sustaining the funding of something that will serve the community and I hope you will step up and make it a priority this year. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk.
press the button. Hello, city council members and um, mayor. Um, I'm a high schooler at the Half Moon Bay High, and I am born and raised here in uh, Moss Beach. And um, I grew up in the basically the high school swimming pool. And um, every time I went in there, I felt a pride for my high school, however, not the pool. Every time we'd go on meets, there'd be all these other children saying, oh, look at our pool, it's so great, so big, and I'm so glad to have this pool. I'm not, not one bit. And moving on from me as a swimmer, me as a lifeguard, I fear for the children I look over, I look after, I should say. Um, the pool is in a U shape, so the shallow ends are at both of the ends. And so when they dive, they have a priority or a, a risk, I'm sorry, a risk of hitting their heads at the bottom of the pool, which I fear for. And I see a lot when they do their flip turns at both sides. I see kids from seven to even younger, seven to 10, uh, the um, kids who are getting, starting to learn how to swim. They're getting injured and I don't want to see that. I want to see change. And hopefully in my time as a high schooler, I will see it. But that's up to you guys. And so I just want to reiterate about what Mr. Hager said about putting the um, funding on your schedule. And thank you. Thank you, Zach. Um, that concludes the uh, public forum. Um, I have no uh, proclamations and presentations. Uh, I have no mayor's announcements. Uh, I have nothing to report out from our recent closed session. Um, the next item on the agenda, I'll, I'll give everybody a chance to, to leave if they want. Thank you all for coming and expressing your opinions. Next item on the agenda is the city manager updates to council. Okay, I already said that. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna he have a law enforcement update from Saul Lopez. Good evening, Mayor, fellow council members, and members of the community. It's an honor to be here with all of you. I'd like to showcase some of the great work that the deputies have been uh, doing lately here in the city. In November, November 2nd of 2018, we had four burglars in the downtown business district, uh, which impacted a lot of the other businesses uh, out of concern. Uh, as you can see, the incidents occurred between midnight and one in the morning and uh, several thousand dollars were lost from these individual businesses. The deputies went into action and worked with our investigations bureau to try to identify a suspect, and I'm proud to say they did identify that person, and he's currently in custody. Um, that individual was also associated to many other burglaries along the Bayside and some of our other jurisdictions, like San Carlos and uh, also in the unincorporated areas. So we, other than the criminal investigation that we conducted, we took a two-prong approach. We went to this proactive model of a business inspection safety program. I dedicated two deputies to contact every business in the downtown corridor and work with the Chamber of Commerce. And basically what this safety program did was provide safety tips to business owners, uh, give them safety assessments uh, to check if they had working security cameras, alarms, and other um, 
issues that we identified and it was very well received. As of today's date, we've had close to 110 businesses that we've contacted and we're gonna actually reach out to all the other businesses in the uh, outer areas of the city. And again, we provided the security assessments and the great thing about this program is that we were able to carry it over to other jurisdictions that we provide services to. So it was well received by the Chamber of Commerce and we're continuing talks with them. Uh, one of the most important things that any deputy or person, one of our staff members, um, when they are investigating a crime is actually finding a responsible uh, store owner in the middle of the night or even a residential owner. So we were able to collect all that information and submit it to our dispatch center. So when we do arrive, we'll have proper contacts. So I suggest that all of you who don't have that information, um, my plan to move forward is to make a voluntary uh, information uh, submission for residents that we can actually add to our dispatch center. And that is all I have. Any questions from the council? Just our appreciation, thank you, so. Absolutely. May I? Go ahead. So, um, is there a discussion among the business owners on Main Street about installing security cameras? We did find that numerous businesses did not have those uh, systems in place, so we did recommend it and encourage it. Uh, it's gonna be up to them to definitely install them. It would help us out a great deal, so, absolutely. I suppose the city could consider a couple of cameras on Main Street just to show the traffic coming and going that might be helpful uh, in the event of an incident. So we, we, yeah, we do have some preliminary talks with the city manager and moving forward there will be some proposals. Thanks for getting on top of it Absolutely. so thoroughly. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, the next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything? Uh, can I have a motion? Sure. Uh, I move that we adopt the consent calendar. Item 1A, waive reading of resolutions and ordinances. Item 1B, warrants for the month of December 2018. Item 1C, approval of Westbrook claim. Item 1D, 2018 Street Reconstruction Project Budget Augmentation, CIP Project Number 514. Item 1E, Amendment to Agreement with SDI Presence LLC to include additional services related to implementation of the Citywide Enterprise Resource Planning System. Item 1F, Communications Consultant Services. Item 1G, Mayor's List of City Council Representatives and Designated Assignments for 2019 and item 1H, library capital donations. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes. Um, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Sure. I would like to make a recommendation possibly that we take a five minute break so we can possibly reboot the system so that you have the PowerPoints in front of you and that will prepare us for the next item. Fine.
Let's continue with the meeting, please. The next item is our draft ordinance to enact residential tenant protection measures. We'll start with our staff report. Good evening, Mayor Merbeck and City Council. Staff is happy to be here tonight. Uh, this item is in response to your request for uh, research to consider options and next steps for uh, consideration of tenant protection measures. Uh, before we begin, uh, the first, very first thing we want to say is if this is not a decision-making meeting. We see a lot of folks in the room and just want to make sure people understand this is not a first reading of an ordinance. This is part of an ongoing conversation in a series of um, uh, different items that City Council has been considering for affordable housing over the last couple of years. Uh, Council, you've been um, looking towards um, addressing housing affordability, housing insecurity uh, throughout the community, and we did put a list of um, a lot of work that's been done in this last year with regards to, to that topic. The ADU ordinance, by the way, I know that some of the folks in the room are really interested in that. It was certified by the Coastal Commission in December. We're very happy about that, and we've been receiving applications that comply with that new ordinance. Um, we've also conducted two large-scale community gatherings to discuss housing, one in July and another in October, and presented a draft housing work plan to you in September, which had a number of parts and pieces that we, we kind of agreed that it didn't need to be uh, screwed down tight. It was a discussion. It was a, it was a living document. And uh, tenant protection measures, that, that topic really came out of the... July community conversation about housing, the council priority session back in the spring, and then uh, the housing work plan study session. We saw you in November and you gave us direction to uh, continue with research and to consider um, some specific measures that could be um, put into place. And also noting that a lot of this uh, work is, is being synthesized and it's in the draft uh, local coastal land use plan development chapter that was just put out in December. And I'm going to be turning this over to Sarah Clark in just a moment. Sarah is with your city attorney's firm, Shoot Mahali, and she is a, an attorney who really specializes in in housing and has been instrumental in helping us with um, the ADU ordinance as well as the work that was done here. But you in November asked us to uh, research uh, rent stabilization and um, we recognized that that would take a lot, that was a lot of work and that was a separate track from the tenant protection measure item that is before you tonight. So we want to really distinguish between the two. Um, we're, we're talking about these tenant protection measures. And then to go ahead and to proceed with um, considering the, the four different options that are available to you, which is where Sarah will begin. Thank you, Jill. Um, thank you, Mayor Rohrbacher, and, uh, sorry, Rohrbach, um, and Council. Um, I'm here today to talk through the four different directions that we have been instructed to develop. Um, what you see attached to the staff report is a draft ordinance that includes all four measures that were discussed back in November. These were drawn from examples that we see throughout the, the San Francisco Bay Area. There's been a lot of development of rental, residential tenant protection measure, measures in other cities, and so we're fortunate that we're not going, going through this with a blank slate, and so we've drawn from a number of other cities that have looked at these and developed these ordinances before. Um, so I'm going to walk through these four different components, and as Jill said, um, we are not talking about rent control, and we are not talking about just cause eviction. Those are um, on a sort of longer trajectory for evaluation. And I would also note that um, because of the state law implications for rent control in particular um, around what kinds of units you can regulate, um, that's something that, that staff is continuing to look at uh, carefully. So with that, I'm going to jump right into the four measures that we are evaluating at this time. Um, I want to start with looking at what units we're talking about here. So the, the City Council has a choice in um, evaluating which units these measures should apply to. 
The tactic that we've taken in the draft ordinance as a suggested starting place is that all four measures would apply, for the most part, equally to the types of residential units that are regulated. Um, so we have drafted an ordinance that covers almost all residential units in the city with certain exceptions. There, there are units where the landlord and tenant live in close proximity to one another. Um, this is an area that we've seen other jurisdictions exempt and, and we've suggested doing that in the draft ordinance here. Um, so that's rentals within a single family home, so someone renting a bedroom or um, a unit above a garage, that sort of thing. Um, this isn't in the ordinance, but based on preliminary feedback, we've also looked, uh, I think, carefully at, at the idea of exempting accessory dwelling units where tenants are on site, um, living adjacent or you know, in direct contact with their landlords. Um, so that's the direction we could go in as well. Um, the other units that aren't affected are units that, where people live, but they're not generally considered residential units. So things like hotels, mobile homes, long-term care units. Um, and finally, we do exempt affordable units that are otherwise regulated through agreements with the city. Um, so an option here is to narrow the application of these measures, either in whole or in part. And so we could look at narrowing to situations where you really have only, or a term, sort of professional landlords. So um, an owner of a multi-unit building um, where the, 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 land, the owner is really using this as their, their profession or their, their money-making income stream. Um, you also see in some jurisdictions where there aren't a lot of multi-unit um, housing stock, where the measure would only apply where a, where a landlord owns a number of units in the city, so where someone has amassed sort of a, a, a swath of units. Starting off with our first option, um, this is uh, the, sort of the core of a lot of residential tenant protection ordinances, and this is the idea of, of requiring a minimum lease term. So in the draft ordinance, you see that the landlord would have to offer the tenant a one-year lease term, both initially and then upon renewal of the, the lease. But the landlord would retain the discretion to sit, set the price, as well as any other terms not related to that, um, that length. Um, and the tenant then has the choice to accept that or reject it. And if he or she rejects it, then the landlord and tenant can negotiate some other form of lease. So that could be um, you know, a month-to-month -month tenancy, which are pretty typical, or a you know, three-year tenancy. They would leave them that room to negotiate. Um, the way that the uh, draft ordinance is, is written is that this would not apply to existing leases that would, go into, that would be in effect at the time the ordinance becomes effective but it would um, include triggers to bring those leases into compliance over time. So that's option one. Um, the second one we look at is enhanced notice provisions. So one of the things that um, makes it difficult for tenants is when they're faced with a termination of a tenancy on rather short notice and may have a difficult time finding housing within a 30-day or 60-day period. State law already provides a backdrop of 30 or 60 day notice, but some jurisdictions have looked at this and said it's, you know, in this tight housing market, it can be very hard to find housing in that short of a time, and so have um, expanded the amount of notice that is required. So in the draft ordinance, you'll see um, language that would require uh, an extended notice provision for 90 days. Um, and then there, there are, of course, ex exceptions here. So if you know, the tenant's not compliant or if the owner wants to move into the unit, um, there's some other ones as well. Options here, you could look at a longer um, notice provision. Uh, so the city of San Jose, for instance, has um, a general floor of a 90-day notice provision, but they have up to a 120-day notice provision if the city manager triggers what they deem a severe housing shortage. Um, so this is the enhanced notice provision. Moving on to um, probably the most, uh, the area where you have the most choice and the most flexibility, and this comes from it being sort of the most complicated, um, is the idea of relocation assistance. So the next portion of the ordinance um, addresses the requirement of landlords to provide departing tenants with cash payments equal to three months of rent in certain circumstances. Um, and I would note that those circumstances in some ways really limit the reach of relocation assistance provisions. So first, um, as drafted, this would only apply to tenants that make less than 120% of the county median income. 
I would also note that there are some additional triggers in here for special circumstances tenants, um, folks who are elderly or disabled or who have minor children living with them at home. Um, the second way that this, the reach of this would be limited is that it would only occur in, in certain circumstances when a tenancy ends. If you're in a year-to-year -year lease and the term just ends, you wouldn't get relocation assistance. And that's because the purpose here is really a way of um, providing tenants with a, a bridge to get to new housing when they weren't anticipating having to leave. And so for that reason, it doesn't apply in these sort of end-of-term um, rental, end rental agreements. Um, but it would apply if a, a tenant left because of a significant rent increase where they were facing um, a, a really a significant rent uh, proposal above and beyond inflation. Here we've set the trigger of 5%, um, but we could look at others. And then also um, when the landlord ends the month-to-month the -month tenancy um, for certain specified reasons. And then finally, I'll note that there is a carve-out here uh, due to state law. So Costa Hawkins is the state law that regulates rent control, um, and it exempts units that are single-family housing or units that were built prior to 1995 from having rent control. Um, and because we have this trigger in here for significant rent increases, as a conservative option, we have included exempting an exemption for such units under this provision just for that rent control trigger. Um, and as I mentioned, you have a lot of options in relocation assistance. In the interest of time, I may sort of, we can come back to the slide, but there's, there's a lot of specificity in, re in relocation assistance options, and um, you can look at changing all of the different triggers, the application, um, when it might apply, how much money folks might get. Um, so we can come back and look at those as we reach the discussion. And then finally, the last provision that we're looking at tonight is the landlord-tenant mediation. And we've done some preliminary look at what other cities do in this area. And this is really providing sort of a service to both landlords and tenants from the city. Um, and the way we've drafted it is that uh, it, it provides an option to either a landlord or a tenant to come to the city with a dispute and say, I you know, request assistance from the city. The city would then have discretion to review the dispute, um, the information that's provided by the party, and if it's deemed sort of in the interest of the city and of the public, it could refer that to mediation services that would be provided by a third party under contract with the city. Uh, Project Sentinel is, is a, a nonprofit organization that provides a number of services um, to other jurisdictions. There are others, other groups out there that, that do this, and so it's part of the further research we would need to do. But as drafted, the ordinance um, simply provides a mechanism for people to have a, a forum for resolving their disputes when it's between a, a landlord and a tenant. Um, so I'm turning this back to Jill. We'll get this to you momentarily. We want to be on, um, so, so that was a sum up of, of really those four, four criteria, lots of detail as you saw. Clearly, we, we have not been able to conduct outreach yet. What we talked to you about in November was that we would um, develop uh, some materials for further consideration in advance of bringing you any first reading. Our intent tonight is to get some direction so that we can um, understand your, your um, desires with this and so that we can do the additional research that we need to do and conduct outreach. And um, what's great is we see a lot of folks in the room and we're hoping um, that we'll get the kind of input that um, will help, help you give us direction. Um, folks who have expertise in the local housing market are, are very important to us. We appreciate that. I do want to note I've been um, talking to uh, housing contract special specialists as well as two mediation services. If you were to um, want to proceed with mediation, we would we would need to have some kind of an RFP to to find somebody to help us with that. I've also been talking to cities that have implemented um, tenant protection measures. It's early in their days for that, and we just we're trying to see how it's going, what it's costing what the staff demand is for that. Um, so there's, there's quite a few layers of complexity to this. So we're, um, although there's this, this draft piece of code in front of you, there's, there's quite a bit more to do. So tonight we're um, looking for your feedback on, on the draft ordinance, those, those four, 
for choices. Any feedback you have or suggestions for outreach and any other uh, consideration that comes forth through, through the community input. And if you have questions, we're, we're happy to field those. Thank you. Sorry, may I ask a question first? Uh, so what I, what I couldn't quite understand from the materials, uh, let's pretend the teacher wants to come in uh, with the ordinance uh, the way we, that it, we're talking about it, and they want to stay for nine months, but they don't want to stay for a year. What, what provision is there in, the, in that? Because I couldn't quite differentiate between that. Sure. Um, so the way that would work is under the first prong, um, the minimum lease term, what would happen is the landlord would offer the teacher a year-long lease, and then the teacher would say, no, I actually don't want to stay here for that period of time. Um, and so they could then negotiate among themselves, and it could either be a lease for nine months, where it's guaranteed that the person gets to stay, or it could be a month-to-month -month tenancy, um, which is what where renters are frequently in, where the landlord only has to provide that minimum period. If they end up in the nine-month lease world, then great, they operate under the terms of that lease, and the, the remainder of the provisions don't really come up. Um, but if they end up in a month-to-month -month tenancy, then what happens is you end up layering on those additional protections of the enhanced notice provision and of that potential relocation assistance. Um, so that's how those interact, and this is where it gets complicated <laughs> um, because you can't really consider these uh, in silos. I have 22 speaker cards, so once again, we're going to restrict uh, the speakers to two minutes each. 23 speakers. Um, and um, I notice a lot of people with uh, stickers that say uh, no rent control. I want to make it clear that the ordinance that we're beginning to consider is a tenant protection ordinance. It is not a rent control or rent stabilization ordinance, and we're required to stick to the agenda items, 24 speakers. Um, we're required to, to stick to the agenda items. So please, uh, if you're concerned about rent control or rent stabilization, uh, come back to the next meeting and talk in public forum, because right now we're talking about tenant protection measures. Okay. With that said, uh, Eric Costanja, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, followed by Eric Harger. Well, there with my name, thank you. Um, I want to start by saying I do not live in Half Moon Bay. I'm a real estate broker in the Northern Peninsula. I live in Pacifica and I work in San Francisco, and I'm here because I do feel that, the te that some of the tenant protections you're talking about probably have some merit, but to separate the tenant protection measures from rent control is incorrect. Um, so I want to make sure that you don't divorce those two things because they are the same thing. Um, I think that... Um, we also have to look at the unintended consequences of what you're talking about, too. Um, in San Francisco, an emergency measure was put on in 1978 uh, because of issues with tenants. Um, and 38 years later, here we still are, more, um, more restrictive than ever, and about 38,000 units that are not on the market because um, owners do not want to rent them. So I would just be careful about what you're suggesting. I'm not saying do nothing, but I'm saying just be careful about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Eric Harger, followed by Kirsten Hagen. Hello, Mayor and uh, City Council members again. Uh, yes, I left, and somebody told me this is on the topic, so I had to come back and say hello again. <laughs> no okay, um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. You can't say one without the other. With respect to the laws of the state of California for tenants, it's almost the strongest in the nation. I mean, the, the folks can squat in your house for six, 12 months, and you can't do anything about it. So to say that there's no protection is absurd, totally ridiculous. And on the back end of it, 
Why is there control over what the agreement between a tenant and a landlord is by the city? If those controls are in place, is the city then going to come back and pay my, my rent for or my uh, mortgage for me or my property taxes? No. If the roof leaks, are you going to replace it for me because there's not enough money to replace that as well? No, you're not going to do it. So looking at the cost of property here in the first place, just to buy the property to then rent it out, it's not trivial. So to then say, well, now we're going to put restrictions on top of you, you're going to limit the amount of units available, not increase them by a long shot. Look at every city that does this, it's horrible. And then when somebody moves out, that rent gets jacked way up. It's not even close. So I highly encourage you to just table this and let the tenants and the landlords have an agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Kirsten Hagen, followed by Gina Zari. Can you press the button? There we go. I'm Kirsten Hagen. I live in Half Moon Bay, and I am a renter. And I do not believe that this is an effective way to tackle our housing cost problem, or I think our biggest problem is we don't have enough housing, and this would actually limit it, our housing even more. Um, when an ordinance ties relocation payments to a rental increase, it is rent control, because you're tying the hands of the landlord. Um, and that means since we have a lot of people who own only, you know, a few units, one or two units, they're, they're individual people, they're not big companies, and it's already very difficult to um, make ends meet or make the numbers work when you're renting property in this area. So uh, one of the things that would increase those, um, the costs is the relocation payments, and that would eliminate the margins that they have and um, could, you know, steal the retirement that they're trying to plan for or also cause them to no longer choose to rent their properties, um, which again exacerbates our housing shortage. So uh, I actually rent uh, from a woman and my last rent increase um, I volunteered for. <laughs> I thought it was, it was time. Um, and I just want to say we need to look for ways to add available units for our tenants and we need to have supply and demand economy that functions in a healthy way and we don't want to limit the available housing any further. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Gina Zari followed by Judy Taylor. Uh, Mayor and council members, thank you for listening to us about this. Um, and thank you to staff for saying that you're intending to reach out to us to discuss this. These are very complicated issues and um, because of that, a lot of what you're discussing is not legal according to state law. It's really important that you understand that property owners, the vast majority of property owners make a very small margin. And when you're placing tremendous burdens on them, you're going to lose housing supply. It's going to be gone. Just like Eric mentioned, in San Francisco, there are nearly 40,000 vacant units because of rent control. That will happen here, too. I want to make it clear, too, that state law and the San Mateo County Association of Realtors and, and most people um, in, that are property owners understand that when you put a cap on rents and you say that amount will trigger relocation payments, that is, relo that is rent control. State law defines it as rent control, Costa Hawkins defines it as rent control, and we define it as rent control. To point out your top six, your largest six property owners, uh, Moon Ridge Apartments by Midpen, 160 units, exempt government subsidized. Half Moon Village by Midpen, 160 units, exempt um, government subsidized. Main Street Park by Midpen, 64 units, exempt government subsidized. Leslie Gardens by Leslie Senior Communities, 63 units, exempt. Um, Ocean View Plaza by Leslie Senior Communities, 50 units, exempt. And Coastside Senior Community by Coastside Senior Housing, 40 units, exempt. So the people affected 
by the policies you're discussing are the very, very small mom and pops that most certainly cannot afford these policies. So I, I really implore you to please talk to us, talk to your property owners, and discuss the consequences of these pieces of legislation because they're not going to have the intended response that you guys would like to see. And I, I know you have the best intentions, but you're not going to find solutions with these policies. I do commend you for the mediation. You're the first city to seriously look at mediation. And that's the only thing that's going to really address the small number of bad property owners who really need to be reeled in because you shouldn't address an entire crowd of good people with policies that hurt everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Judy Taylor followed by Mariah Betancourt. Good evening, thank you. And um, <laughs> January, and haven't been able to get past January without coming to a public meeting. <laughs> Anyways. Um, Truly, there has been a lot of pain that has happened because of what's gone on in the real estate market and what has gone on in the Bay Area in particular. It is very painful. And I, like Gina, commend you for taking this on and for listening to people and hearing that pain. The problem is that rent control, and it is rent control, any time that you interfere with the relationship between the property owner and their tenant, you are controlling that rental and that is rent control. We tend to think of rent control as being synonymous with the rent cap, and rent control is always much broader than that. So it is about rent control. Um, one of the things is I've been very actively involved in real estate for 41 years and very involved in the building community, and in my entire 41 years, I have sold one new duplex. When a builder looks at, it's gonna cost me X to buy the lot, it's going to cost me Y to build it. They look at what it's going to cost to do a single family versus what it will cost to do a multifamily. The multifamily does not pencil out. The only way that I have seen builders doing it is that they do it for themselves when they get enough of a pot that they can take six to nine months off of working for other people to build their <coughs> own and then they hold it long term. Those are the only people that I have seen that have been able to make money doing multifamily. When you look at the history of the coast side, and this is something that I'll try to control my outrage on, for, for decades, we have had the Coastal Commission saying, you, your land uses will be agriculture and visitor serving. Both of those industries require lots of low income labor. And the Coastal Commission at the same time has said, you won't build new houses. And I have seen this community rush to the polls to embrace that. And now we've got a problem, and this problem is being transferred to very small property owners. And that's not right, and it's not effective. Thank you, and please look further. Talk to the building community about what it takes to build these units. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Mariah Betancourt, followed by Jim Sutro. Hi, I'm Mariah Betancourt, and I'm a realtor with Delmar Properties, and I manage close to 100 single-family units, most of them, here on the coast. So I'm really involved in this. Um, basically, when you're talking about those relocation costs, I can't even imagine what that would do to most of the owners that I manage for. I would say at least 70% of the people that I manage for only own one property. A lot of them are people who've had to move out of the area for one reason or another. They want to hold on to this house because they want to come back here. They have roots here. You guys all know how the roots of the coast run deep. So, you know, for most of the people that I manage for, this is, they're sort of landlords of necessity, not really these big investors. We have no big corporate um, apartment complexes here. Everyone's sort of a mom and pop. So I really, I, I, you know, for my clients and for the people I see, I think this is really heavy handed. A 
Okay, is it better? Okay. I know it's hard for the tenants. I deal with them every day. I try to be super fair with all of the tenants. So I know that we have a problem. I think what Judy just said is right. We need more low-income housing. I know that's a tough, nobody wants that anywhere. But I really think that this rent control idea, and this is rent control, is a bad idea. Jim Sutro, followed by Barbara Levy. Good evening. Jim Sutro, lived on the coast quite a while. I didn't realize I was a professional landlord. Uh, my intention in purchasing property was so my kids could have a place to live when they got old. And uh, they've chosen not to live here, but uh, the money that I've been able to scrounge as a professional landlord seems to go to help them out to build fences to pay to, to build to buy their own homes so it all kind of goes in a circle let's be very careful what we're doing here we're talking rent control light maybe this is the the first step to it this is tenant protection you're protecting them from me I depend upon them. Why would I want to hurt them? You want to protect them, but you're not doing anything to protect me. Be careful. You got the tail on the wrong end of the dog here. A lease is fine. If somebody loses his job, can't pay, he's facing big penalties if he breaks a lease. That's a legal agreement. That's a contract. Somebody that does not have a job that's really solid should not be taking a lease. Be careful what you're getting them into because you're leading them into a swamp. Be careful. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Barbara Levy followed by Frank Vela. Good evening, thank you. It's Barbara Levey. I'm sorry. That's so right. <laughs> Long-time resident, long-time renter. I've been a homeowner now for 23 years, thank God. And I do have a bit of a rental in the back of my house. And I would be scared to rent out to anybody if looking at these. I rent, I, I do a fair rental and I take good care of my property. And I have had clients that have taken full advantage of rent control in San Francisco. They've had their rent control, now is their pied a terre. And they go out and they buy their second home. One person keeps the lease in San Francisco, in the couple, and the other one comes down here and puts their new home in their name. And it's really cool because they can have their friends stay up in San Francisco and they can keep that rent control and I know other people with rent control apartments in San Francisco that, quite frankly, the landlords can't afford to maintain them. They're rat infested, they're leaky, the windows are old, it's horrible. Uh, so I would really love to see us all come together and maybe do some workshops. I really, I love the way that we all can talk and get along. I think that a lot of your intentions are really good and I'd like to be there with you, helping find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Frank, Frank Vella, followed by Juliet Calder. Hello. Thanks for having me. We know this is a difficult issue. Housing shortage everywhere in the Bay Area is tough. But rent control, and this is what it is, does not solve that problem. You could look at San Francisco with the number of vacant units are on the market or off the market because owners don't want to put themselves in jeopardy due to the rent control issues. I live in Pacifica. We went through a rent control vote. It failed by almost three to one. It was not a good ordinance. In the long run, it does not help out tenants. It just restricts our availability of housing. It's great to talk about arbitration, working with SAMCAR, 
California Association of Realtors, but rent control is not the way to go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Juliet Calder, followed by Linda Cross Anderson. Hi, good evening. Good evening, am I really loud? No. <laughs> um, thank you for your attention to affordable housing here on the coast, as some of the other uh, people have said before me, it is a problem. I think we all recognize it, especially those of us that are realtors. I think one of the reasons there are um, realtors in the room tonight is 12 hours ago, we were in this room, and I first heard about this at the realtor meeting. So that's why I'm still here 12 hours later. I'd rather be at home watching Downton Abbey because I restarted that again. Um, so I was a little frustrated this morning and surprised that uh, we needed to show up here tonight to talk about it because I thought this had gone to vote recently, very, very recently, and was shut down as far as the voters in the state and I think locally. So I was very kind of caught off guard. Um, call it tenant protection measures, that's fine. I just don't think we need additional tenant protection measures. I don't think it's the answer. Um, we see sellers, there's been many situations in our in real estate where I've seen sellers um, need to give notice to tenants and it's usually because the sellers are dealing with some kind of life changing issue. It could be health, there might be a death, there might be a divorce. Either way, it's tough on both sides and if the sellers are put in a position to need to pay, it could, it could really break them. Um, cost of ownership here is very expensive. I looked at the, I was just adding up the 25 years I've been on the coast and I, we've rented 18 years and seven years owned. So we've been in and out of renting more than owning here. So I know what it feels like on both sides. Um, one story and kind of what Barbara was saying, I actually had a client that came down to Half Moon Bay, a buyer to buy a, a house here. And I asked what your motivation, where do you work? What is your, um, kind of finding out what the commute would be like. And I found out they're both attorneys in San Francisco and they're looking to buy a two to three million dollar house here uh, for the weekends. So I said, okay, so you're not worried about the commute. They said, no, we have a rent control property in San Francisco. We've had it for many years. We will never give it up. And now we've saved up enough money to buy a property here. So that's just one example of why I just don't think it works. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Linda Cross Anderson, I hope I got that right, followed by Tim Pond. <laughs> You did, thank you. Actually, it's gross, but gross. that's okay. That's cool. Well, close. <laughs> thank you for allowing me to come up here and address you. I am a Half Moon Bay resident. I am also a realtor with Coldwell Banker. And with the exception of the mid pen communities and the other communities that Gina had mentioned, nearly all of the rental housing providers in our cities are mom and pop operations. And these ordinances would create a tremendous burden on all small housing providers by tying their hands with uh, unreasonable and expensive regulations. So many of the people here, even though the only way they could really survive here and be able to own property is to have the ability to be able to rent to subsidize their incomes. And so I, I'm urging you to use care in drafting this ordinance. Uh, and that's it, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Pond, followed by Jan Gray. Uh, try now, try again. <laughs> Push the button. <laughs> yeah. Tim Pond, 30 year resident this year at the coast side. And um, I have actually been in the position of having to pay somebody to move out of one of my properties. I think the rental laws in California are fairly strong in favor of the tenant as it stands. And also I think the basic problem is high rent and the reason that we have high rent is housing shortage. I read one figure that there were 20 jobs created in San Mateo County for every housing unit created. 
You cannot expect anything but a crisis out of that. I, I actually design accessory dwelling units, and I've designed 12 so far in the past 10 months. And I think that that is a solution that you should look at. And the city council here actually banned people that own their homes from renting out their homes if they own an accessory dwelling unit. So they shortened the housing supply, restricting and, and probably stifled the development of it. I know at least one person that was thinking of doing it that saw that clause and said that they wouldn't do it. That clause alone and is stifling the production of more rental units, I think. So what you have to do is encourage smaller, more demographically appropriate housing like accessory dwelling units in, in, in as many ways as you can. And that, I think, is a better solution than adding more regulations. And I'm generally in favor of regulations. I'm not one of these anti-regulation people. I think regulations are great. They're tremendously, tremendously great. <laughs> and uh, we basically, I, I, and, and reading what, I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on until I came tonight. Almost everybody in Half Moon Bay that is a landlord is exempt from this. And I don't know who would enforce this and what court it would go to, but I see that the courts are so overburdened. This person I had to pay to move out of my house, I went and checked with a lawyer and they said it would be six months before I even got to court on an eviction. So this person just plain out flat decided not to pay me. And I basically had to give them $1,500 to move out of my house. You know, so anyway, that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hey, can, can, I, can I get staff to comment on the ADU ordinance piece that he was talking about? Maybe after. Uh, maybe after yeah. But uh, that's, that's a piece yeah. I'm not familiar with. Uh, Jan Gray, followed by Steve Hyman. Good evening. My name is Jan Gray. I'm very proud to say that me and my family have lived here for 50 years. I've been involved in real estate community for 44, but I'm not speaking as a real estate broker. I'm just speaking as a person who observes the comings and going in the rental market. And I think Mariah is probably one of the best speakers that we've had. But Tim made me laugh because he took all my statements. So <laughs> let me just say it's a bad idea. Thank you, Jan. Steve Hyman, followed by Susan Lewis. Good evening. Thank you very much for letting me speak. My name is Steve Hyman. I'm the owner of Century 21. I also write for the Half and Bay Review, and I've done that for on real estate for around 20 years. And I'm a 35-year Half and Bay resident. Um, we do have a housing problem here part of which I think is self-inflicted by the community and that's been going on for over three decades with building no new subdivisions. So we have a very fixed supply of housing and there doesn't seem to be any real impetus in the community to expand that. Everything is, seems to be fought for decades. Secondly, we're part of a booming economy in San Mateo County and also Silicon Valley with companies like Google, Facebook growing rapidly, paying people exorbitant salaries and stock options, and that puts a lot of pressure on all the rents. I think your suggestion is really going to have very negative unintended, unintended consequences where you're going to get a lot of landlords who have owned property for a long time here saying, why do I want to live here? I'll just do an exchange, sell my property, move elsewhere, and you will find a big shrinkage of rental properties here. And since we don't build anything, or even if it does get built, like Pacific Ridge took 30 years, you're just going to exasperate the problem, and you're going to find rents going higher and higher and higher as the supply gets smaller and smaller. So I, again, ask you to think twice, twice about what you're doing, because I think this is a failed strategy that is going to boomerang. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Susan Lewis, followed by Roy Stotts. Mayor, council members, I'm an office manager for a small mom and pop rental business. We have happy long-term tenants. We don't have conflicts. We value our tenants. 
Um, it's been said that the best way to make a small fortune in real estate is to start with a large one. <laughs> We're not rich. And let me be blunt, we don't have a lot of time. This ordinance, I've read it several times, will not provide the stable, affordable housing we all want to see. It's not fair, it's not balanced, we will lose housing. Recently, we voted in Proposition 1. It passed here in Half, Half Moon Bay, 61%. $4 billion in a fund for affordable housing. It is tailor-made. Why don't we grab that money? Why don't we do some good things with it? On the same ballot, we all voted against Prop 10, 58% in Half Moon Bay. These ideas were voted down statewide, voted down in Pacifica, San Mateo, Santa Cruz, Burlingame, for good reason. Informed voters read these ordinances. They don't work for our communities. These policies tell, unfortunately, housing providers to get out of business. Every day, I get these cards. I get these cards from my realtor friends, six, eight, ten cards a day. These are from cities that have rent control in our area. They're from San Jose, they're from Mountain View. People dumping properties because they can't stand the grief, the overhead, and losing money with rent control or these type of tenant protection ordinances. It tells other people don't get into the rental business as the gentleman suggested. Anybody who looks at these ordinances, no, 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 that's okay, I don't, I don't need that trouble. Reading the draft ordinance, such things as combining, setting the rent with just calls together. This tells tenants, expect your rent to go up each and every year. Absolutely, your tent rent will go up. That's not always the case. Many times uh, a year goes by, we don't raise rents. So tenants are made to suffer with bad neighbors under these ordinances. And I've worked it out, 30 cents of every tenant dollar under these ordinances goes to nothing but supporting the bureaucracy and the administration of these types of policies. It doesn't do the tenant any good, it doesn't do the housing provider any good, and it doesn't do our communities any good. The uh, section in here on LinkedIn notifications, it's out of step with state law. It greatly complicates tenant-landlord relationships. For instance, the idea of a 90-day notice on a month-to-month -month, uh, lease turns that lease into a three-month, four-month lease for, for all practical purposes. That's unfair to both parties. The idea of relocation fines. Could you wrap up, please, Susan? Yes. Okay. Uh, you find the wrap-up spot. <laughs> okay. The way this ordinance is structured, it, it tells the property owner to never offer anything but a one-year lease because otherwise they're in a liability of these relocation fines, which are exorbitant. And unfortunately, the language tells our housing providers to avoid renting to the very people we want, seniors and families. It's a huge liability. Please look into renter's insurance. It has a loss of use section. Renter's insurance only costs 10 or $12 a, a month and covers up to $25,000 of just these type of relocation headaches. Please use some of our $2.1 million housing fund subsidize if need be. Renter's insurance would go a long way. We don't need to start a war. We can do this right. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Roy Stotts followed by Suzanne Drake. I'm Roy Stotts. I'm a 42-year resident and property owner uh, on the coast. Um, what I'd like to do is talk about the tale of two cities, and one is San Francisco. In San Francisco, in a an article that was done by NBC Bay Area, Bay Area, July of 2018, it's very easy to find, comes up on the first page of the Google search, um, indicates that San Francisco has the highest rent in the world. Second's Bermuda, Bermuda. third is um, New York, uh, fourth is, Oak, uh, I'm sorry, San Jose. Hmm, what do they have in common? They're all, except for Bermuda, they all have rent control. I moved to Bermuda in the heartbeat. Uh, even though they're second highest. Um, there's another city that's on that list, and so San Francisco, for one bedroom, one bath, their median income, uh, the median price for that is $3,500. There's another city called Boston that has the same thing, one median uh, price is one bedroom, one bath, is $2,400, $1,100 less. 
What doesn't Boston have? Well, first of all, they have universities, more universities than San Francisco, more hospitals. They have the same sort of uh, infrastructure in terms of building, uh, having uh, research and development labs everywhere. But what they don't have is rent control. And it has a, a our son does uh, manage his property in New Bedford. And you can get there a average one bedroom, one bath in New Bedford uh, for about $850. So it has a trickle-down effect. Boston's still very expensive, 2400 for one bedroom bath. But what it shows is that the reason, first of all, that New, uh, Boston does not have rent control is that the, city, uh, the state of Massachusetts, in their wisdom, basically did away with rent control at the state level, said no city can have rent control. And it's had a wonderful building effect. In California, where you do have rent control, it's been a disaster. Rent control doesn't work, and it... it <clears throat> It, not only does it not work, you'll make the situation worse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne Drake, followed by Mike Haddock. Hi, I'm Suzanne Drake, and uh, sorry if you don't like our rent control stickers. So I think that uh, we'll take your PowerPoint slides and turn those into stickers next time if that's more applicable, because bottom line is, it is rent control or an overarching of it. The tenant protection, uh, specifically with regard to relocation payments, is way out of step. Um, I'm what you call a mom and pop. I own uh, rental property in Pacifica. I own property, rental property in El Granada, as well as Truckee, California. And uh, I got to tell you, I have been looking at Half Moon Bay. I actually am a graduate of Half Moon Bay High School. So I have roots here. And uh, I have looked at Half Moon Bay in consideration for buying further property. Not with this. So consider mom and pops like me. I'm a, I'm a small fry. I don't have a big LLC behind me or a corporation. Most of us don't. Uh, but keep that in mind, bear that in mind when you want to attract investors such as myself that would be glad and uh, happy to contribute to the rental property um, that is afforded here. And the bottom line is one more thing, um, as business people, turnover is bad, it's bad for business. Um, anybody that actually has any rental property, we know that once you lose a good tenant, it's a pain in the rear end. You got to go in, you got to fix stuff up. It's a huge investment in, pro in, in the property itself. It's actually more advantageous to have, you know, treat the person right and have them stay. You know, you're not, it, nobody's psycho around here raising the rent $500 at a pop. That just doesn't happen. So that's why this is just really out of step with reality. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Mike Haddock, followed by Glenn Mitchell. Uh, council members, I'm here this evening representing mom and pop housing providers, and mostly to protect my tenants from more costly knee-jerk regulations. Your staff just spewed out the biggest bunch of socialist rent control that I've ever heard in my life. If that's not the clearest message to tell everybody in this room that's a housing provider and any of those entertaining the idea to get the heck out of Half Moon Bay for their business, I, I don't know what, uh, maybe I can't hear. It, we are so unfairly villainized by politicians and our good socialist friends at fraud, excuse me, faith in action, and the like, they continually sponsor emotional cry stories of 100% rent increases and evictions as if it were the norm. Renters are our good friends. They're our customers. We don't treat them like that. We're in the business of filling vacancies, not creating them. The sobering facts are that in San Mateo County, only one one hundredth of one percent of all renters were evicted over a three-year period. That's not my statistics. That comes straight from our opposition. How many renter protections will ever be freaking enough in California? California Civil Code, 
sections 1947 through 2000 and beyond. All the sections and chapters must have over a thousand. Anybody know how many renter protections there are in the California Civil Code? I can't answer that. If California politicians truly cared about our customers as much as we do, the last thing in your mind, the last thing you would do was, would be put in more egregious, costly regulations that only cost, make it, that cost more for us to provide their housing and what does that do to the rents? The facts are that the properties around here regrettably have skyrocketed and so have all the uh, costs that go along with it, taxes, insurance, all the onslaught of stuff we have to pay. And the rents have only followed that by about 50%. The reason for that is the medium range tenants just can't afford any more than that. That's the facts of the matter. If you folks took any of the properties for sale in, in this area, anywhere on the peninsula or on the coast, you'll find that it doesn't pencil out to rent it out. It's, it's, please, it's please just wrap up. Please okay, wrap up. I'm closing up. Okay. Um, here's a little something I want to throw out. You guys want renter protections? Has any of your staff looked into rental insurance for renters? It provides up to two years of relocation insurance for somewhere in the range of $130 a year, aside from something like $100,000 worth of personal liability insurance. Maybe that's something that you should investigate. Uh, good for all, I know as a, a government entity, you thank can't you, recommend thank you very it, much. but thank we can. You. Do no damage, please. Brian Ponte, followed by Jim Sutro. Uh, did I, didn't do that right? <laughs> you, you are Brian, right? I am Glenn Mitchell. Oh, you're Glenn Mitchell. I'm one behind. Sorry, Glenn. Go ahead. Um, thank you for having me. I, so many of these people have said it better than I can say it, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, I do think whatever you want to call it, that uh, it's an extreme violation of personal property rights. Um, it shouldn't even be on the board here or discussed, in my opinion. Um, and basically, I, I had this all outlined. I was going to kind of pick things apart. But I understand that this is just a draft. Um, and so we've got room to improve there. So I'd like to kind of throw out some of my opinions that will hopefully help you improve it a little bit. Um, page three, it starts out and, and talks about that you're actually creating a barrier. Why would we be creating a barrier for anything? Um, we wouldn't create barriers for the businesses on Main Street. Real estate, rentals, it's, it's a business. Um, if you created a barrier against the Main Street businesses, they're going to go away or they'll have to raise their, their prices. It doesn't help the consumer. Um, before this goes anywhere, before it's even discussed, we need to have statistics and supporting information. And there's none of that, absolutely none of it. It mentions other cities, Santa Cruz, Menlo Park. Well, they're doing it. We all know that if we practice finances like the government, we'd be broke. So why are we looking at these other cities and say, well, we're going to copy them when we don't even have any numbers? So before this goes one step further, before you guys even waste your time on it, get some numbers. I, I personally don't think they exist, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to help. Somebody mentioned uh, having support groups or, or talking about this. I've done property management. I've managed hundreds of, of units. Um, I've, I've, I don't have these issues. I don't have problems. Tenants and owners, you can work things out. Um, and we can do that without somebody overlooking us and telling us, well, you have to do this. It's going to shut down the business. Um, you know, the mom pops here. It, it just, it, none of this makes sense. Um, it, my last, uh, my, my point here, I guess that I'm going to just finish up with is, we're in a good time right now, so things are rolling, it's all good. If you look back to 2008, 2009, 2010, I had plenty of people that were coming to me that did not want to be in the rental business, but they wanted help. They didn't want to lose their house. They didn't want the stigmatism of uh, filing for bankruptcy. These were, were people that were just, just like you and I, just average Joes. 
trying to find a way to make it. As soon as the property prices turned around, they got out. They didn't want to be part of this. If you put stuff like this in effect now, and if we go through another time like that, and hopefully that never happens, you've got a bigger mess. And I, I think maybe we're not looking at the entire picture here. So I'd encourage you to do that, look at the entire picture, get the facts before we go any further, and um, thank you for your, your time in this. Thank you, Glenn. Brian Ponte, followed by Jim Sutro. Good evening, Mayor, Rarrock, and members of the City Council. Thank you for holding this meeting to collect the thoughts and opinions of those of us interested in this matter. I urge you to go no further with this ordinance. A few brief comments. It will threaten the livelihoods of many small investors who rely on these real estate investments to support themselves. Many of the property owners are small mom and pop investors who are not wealthy people, the majority of whom uh, operate their business very responsibly and sensitively to the needs of their tenants. It will also create a situation like the one the city of Mountain View is now experiencing. There it is well publicized that since Mountain View adopted rent control two years ago, over 100 units have been taken off the market because you have a situation where you have relatively low density buildings on large parcels. The owners cannot operate in that environment. They're selling them. They're being replaced with owner occupied housing. The rent control has having the opposite effect that it was intended. Low income people are now losing their homes. This is not good public policy. In closing, I ask you to work closely with the staff from SAMCAR and identify appropriate solutions to the issue at hand. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Jim Sutro, followed by David Klein. Jim already spoke. Oh, he did. You've got two cards in here. Um, David Klein, followed Hello. by Frank Vento. My name is David Klein. I'm a Coastside resident, and I lived here and worked here for a number of years. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor of city council and staff for your work. I'm against the ordinance. Uh, it's, it's a very important topic, but I think if we're going to do something, it should be by public vote or ballot for consideration so that the entire public gets to participate, let the residents make the decision. This is both a social and economic question. It impacts both the tenants and property owners, both young and old. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Vento, followed by James Benjamin. How many more do we have? <laughs> what, what? Uh, what was it? What are they saying? That's it. That's it. This two, is, two. yeah, last two. Uh, Frank Vento, thank you for your service to the city, uh, staff included. Um, this ordinance is basically addressing an issue with, that we have which is a supply and demand issue. The supply is greater than the demand. Um, the co-side, as noted before, is against growth. So it's, it's something that's never, I don't think will ever be resolved, but trying to implement this ordinance to fix the problem is not gonna work. I help a couple clients take care of properties. To just give you some numbers, she has a duplex, which would fall into your uh, category of an owner living near the tenant, and a triplex would too, so you have more expansion there. Two units, she collects $3,800 a month. Overall a year, she clears about $10,000. So if you give a three month relocation payment, that's 11,400, she's just lost money. She has two families in those two units right now, four months. That's $15,200. So now you have a property owner that just lost $5,200 and you have a tenant moving somewhere else on her dime. That's just not good business. Thank you. Thank you. 
James Benjamin is our last speaker on this topic. Uh, thank you. Um, congratulations, Mayor, members of the council. Um, dad, it's my dad's birthday today, he turns 94. Happy birthday, Dad. Um, I'm uh, not a realtor, I'm not a landlord. Uh, I am a member of the Planning Commission, but I'm speaking as an individual tonight, and I am neither for nor against the uh, ordinance ideas that were presented. Uh, but I think it's important to point out that in our local coastal program draft, we're talking about um, uh, housing issues in a way that the public's comments tonight suggests that they have some of the, um, a, a component of the experiences that we should be considering as we think about whether we want to provide the kind of uh, housing on public and quasi-public land that we're were considering in the draft development chapter that has been released in the last month or so. The idea here is that we, uh, we would need to be sure that we knew how those lands were going to be administered, or at least if we believe that the policies that are described here are relevant for those tenants, we need to decide whether they're relevant for tenants in this quasi-public or public land. So would it apply to for example, the employees of the state beaches who would be living uh, in areas that they would be permitted to bid housing on. What about the school district? Um, what about other cases where we're going to allow development? The idea is that um, these laws could be a, a springboard <laughs> if they're good or a springboard if they're bad and it could amplify their effects. And we should take advantage of the opportunity to learn the war stories that underlie the concerns that I heard expressed tonight. I also think that needs to be balanced with understanding that there are probably some success stories out there. And as, a, as members of the staff and the, the council, I think it's really in our interest to understand all of those perspectives and think about this other dimension of housing. Thanks for your time tonight. Thank you, Jimmy. I, I bring it back to the council. Yeah, I um, know that the staff is currently uh, working on um, compiling the information on the number of landlords and the types of units that the landlords own um, so that we can be better informed about what the actual issues are. I think that's going to be critical in, in making any decisions, so I'm really grateful that staff is working on that. Um, the other thing that comes to mind, when people were talking about rental insurance, um, I'm not sure what rental insurance uh, protection, what, what protections are offered with rental insurance. But if it's going to protect tenants from month-to-month -month leases, which they don't want, they want year-long leases, if it's going to protect them from um, short notices of eviction, then if it's only 10 bucks a month, maybe the landlords could absorb that cost. Um, we haven't heard tonight from any of the people that have been evicted um, or the people that have been told that their rent was going to go up 100%. We heard from them over the past year during our housing discussions and our community input. They're not here tonight, so we're hearing one side of the story, but the other side of the story is extremely painful. Um, and that's one part that I'm going to be considering, as well as what everybody has said here tonight. This side. Um, so I, I think we've, um, I've heard some very useful information tonight that I'd like to uh, follow up on. I'd like to know more about um, renter's insurance, for one. Uh, two, I'd like to understand the, the landscape of our rental community better, like who are the property owners slash landlords and what sort of units. Is it mom and pop? Uh, frankly, 
um, I'm, I would not prioritize uh, restrictions on sort of mom and pops, and I think we have to, you know, define that. I understand the, the need and um, desire to, um, you know, make some money for yourself by rent renting property. My concern are corporate landlords. I mean, that's where I think rent control and other sorts of restrictions might be more applicable when you're dealing with large-scale people like Blackstone or even lesser, you know, smaller scale but, but corporate um, landlords. Those are the ones I think that we would want to keep more of an eye on. Uh, I do think that if the landlord community doesn't police itself, do a better job of policing itself and managing rent increases, the state's going to take care of it. And that might not be what you want either. So maybe you want to work with communities on, on solutions and, and hope the state doesn't do something, you know, really drastic, because that could be coming. I, I read today in the paper uh, that uh, Senator Weiner now is thinking about an anti-gouging um, statute, much in the um, kind of paralleling what we do like after a wildfire. You can't sell things at 500% increases to people who've lost their homes in wildfires, right? So maybe you have an anti-gouging statute. I would support that 100%, frankly. Um, I saw a recent map from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission that showed in our part of the county that rent increases have averaged 15 to 40 percent. Is that gouging? You know, the CPI is maybe four and a half percent. Do you consider 40 percent a reasonable rate of return on, on rent? I think that might be construed as gouging under a state statute. It's not 500 percent like we're seeing in some cities, but you know, and for middle income or lower middle income people, it might just ten dollars or twenty five dollars might you know make a big difference. So, I would definitely treat corporate landlords and those issues quite differently than mom and pops. If truly what we have here is mom and pops, but I'd like to understand that. And staff is very busy. I would not want to lay that on you to do that research. I would say, you know, fi find a college intern or, or, or someone who can, you know, work on that information. I think we should understand that no matter what, no matter how we proceed. So I'd be very reluctant to be, you know, too, you know, regulatory on the moms and pops. I'd want to be really careful about that. I'm very concerned about market interventions. As we all know, those can have unpredictable consequences and have distortions in other part of our economy. So I, I'm reluctant to just knee-jerk impose restrictions if they are not needed. And I'm still not persuaded, you know, that I understand our landscape enough to, to make that call and to give informed um, input. I thought the information on the um, the rental communities, the larger ones that we do have, was compelling, you know, with Moon Ridge. Um, is that the, the largest, you know, piece of our rental community? If so, you know, that would shape how we approach this. Um, so I'm not going to act reflexively on this. I want more information about the, the landscape. Um, I do think that mediation is a good idea. I think if the landscape other than the, the senior communities, is more of the small-scale mom-and-pop sorts of things. I think mediation can be very effective in that environment. If you have uh, landlords who are largely locals or live nearby and have just a few units, um, I th in, in a small community, I think there's likely to be more of a responsiveness to these sorts of situations. So I'm kind of favoring mediation, I'm kind of favoring looking at rental insurance and understanding how that works, that might be something that we can ex expend our affordable housing in lieu on. Um, but at this point, I'm not willing to like support the ordinance that we have before us. But, but with respect saying, I think staff has done an amazing job in a short period of time to pull together at least a vehicle that we can you know, respond to and react to that the public can see and comment on. 
And an another component that's important to me is outreach to the landlord and property owner community. And, and those of you who maybe just rent out a room in your house, I'd like to hear what your experience is. And so outreach is really important to me. And I don't want to, you know, brush to judgment without doing that level of outreach. So I think it pays for us to be, to be prudent and to not look for one um, solution fits all sorts of things just because so-and-so is doing it in another town. Do we have to do it? I, I think we need local control and, and custom solutions that work for our community. So that's kind of the direction that I would like to go in. Just one comment. Um, some people mentioned various statistical data points. And I agree with the gentleman who said, yeah, you know, we should really have more data. And I think uh, we agree on that. I simply caution that if you're going to bring an arithmetical data point before us, that it's something that would apply generally and not some specific case that we could fact check. Otherwise, could it, it hurts credibility both ways, whether we do it. There's folks who present examples here. Thanks. So, okay, this is a big topic. Uh, straight out of the dictionary, all right? We'll talk about what rent control is directly out of the dictionary for all of you. Uh, rent control is a government regulation of the amount charged as rent for housing. In other words, rent control is a program that places limits on how much landlords may raise rent on existing tenants. I don't think that's being discussed tonight. I uh, just want to throw that out there as the first part of my conversation. Uh, but interestingly enough, um, when it comes to this topic, I, I, I agree with uh, Debbie and uh, I remember your name over here, R Robert. <laughs> I want to call you Joe for, for, from, the, from the other meeting. But uh, we do need more information because we need to know what other cities are doing this. Uh, in my understanding of research on this topic, uh, many cities, and this was brought up before, who have a, an initiated some form of rent control, which again is different from this, which is why it's hard for me to differentiate between the two things, um, but have, have seen housing shortages, have seen rent shortages. So I, I, you know, I don't want to have to go through the adverse impacts of that. Uh, I don't understand the cost to the city in creating something like this. Um, the price benefit cost, or however you want to call it, the trade-off cost of us putting resources into something like this, I think is vast. Um, the amount of information I'd like to have before we were to adopt something like this is actually quite vast. Um, talking about the other cities, uh, anybody that's implemented this would like to know what happened to their housing inventory before, after, how long it took, what kind of concerns came up. Um, and, uh, you know, how people go through the complaining process, uh, what that means for us in the city, do we have to, you know, the mediation piece, where, where, where does it all lay in, in, in the scheme of things? Uh, personally, I think we have bigger fish to fry um, than kind of like imposing something that I don't think not any of us really fully understand what the implications are fully yet. Um, so, uh, personally, I'd like to move this on to like a way further time period down the line where we can get a lot of those answers and continue to work on some of the other pieces of, of, of legislation that we have coming up um, from that standpoint. But I'll, I'll leave you with this. I mean, there's my, my biggest piece on this is generally, you know, the marketplace needs to regulate itself. And I think, uh, for the most part, the rental community does a good job of that. There are, of course, bad apples, which is probably why we're here talking about this right now. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, I think the community's good. And uh, we're not going to be dealing with rental increases in terms of capping out anything like that. We're talking about little protections here and there. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's worth the political consequences even to to go down that road for a very minute helping of the community um, at large. So that's, that's my perspective. Um, I heard a couple of comments about the uh, importance of mediation. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Sentinel 
group is willing to help. And I think that at a very minimum, we should uh, get that information out to the tenant community and the landlord community so that uh, we can try to minimize uh, disputes between those groups. Uh, that's something that can be done right away, I believe, and I, I encourage that to happen. Um, I agree with uh, most of my colleagues who say that uh, we need more information about the landscape. How many renters are there? How many landlords are there? Um, how many commercial landlords are there? Um, that kind of information can inform uh, our efforts. And lastly, in terms of outreach, I think that's extremely important. And uh, I would like to model our outreach on the outreach we had about cannabis, where we had the entire communities come out and had multiple meetings um, without uh, serious time restrictions. Uh, tonight, we heard almost exclusively from the uh, landlord community, the realtor community, and, and that's one um, <coughs> constituency that we really need to hear from. But I would also like to hear from renters. Um, and I think uh, in an outreach setting where we encourage both landlords and tenants to, to come and speak their minds, we can get a lot more information. So I agree we're not ready to uh, have a first reading of this ordinance. We need to get the landscape set. We need to do more outreach. But I think it's a worthy goal to head for. So, yeah, this is not good. Um, adding on to your um, mention about information, I think maybe having information on the city's website about um, tenants' rights, you know, maybe if people sort of understood their rights, they might not, you know, they, they might have a better handle on their situation. And, and be able to access resources and resolve issues and conflicts. So I think education is very important. Maybe we just link to county information, but you know, we make that available. And certainly the mediators would make that available, I believe, if there's an issue. So. Yeah, in terms of, in terms of um, tenant rights, most of the complaints that we heard during our sessions, on, our listening sessions last year, about housing came from people who are maybe not be citizens. They're, they're poor people. They're people that don't necessarily speak English. And the, the stories that we heard were egregious. Telling them that they have tenants' rights, it's not going to help. So that's one thing we can do, but it doesn't solve the crisis that this community, that 30%, I, I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's a large percentage of our community who are living well below even low income and are paying exorbitant rents and barely scraping by, getting to pay it, and then finding all of a sudden their lease is up because the, the landlord can find somebody who can spend more. That's the community I want to address. I have no interest in seeing the mom and pops, whatever you want to call them, anybody, any, any, any citizen in our, in our community having financial burdens that they can't bear. I don't want to see that. But I do think we have to address the concerns of those people that are suffering right now. And I don't want to put this off till next year because it's such a big problem. Because it's such a huge problem, I want to deal with it now. And I think the idea of getting the landlord community together with the tenant community, with the underprivileged, with the overprivileged, whatever, to have community discussions is critical. And as I said at the beginning, um, staff has already decided that they're going to be describing that landscape to us. It's already in the works. So when we get that information, we'll be able to bring that back to the community and make better decisions. 
So we probably need some meetings with translation services if we are going to reach out to that particular community and also identify there are resources out there. There are organizations in San Mateo County that can help that um, demographic and that constituency in our community. But I don't know their names, but they're there. And we need to bring those resources to bear as well. So. And, and I'm also not, sh I mean, to me, if we are, if we're talking about tenant protection and we're talking about people that don't want to engage in, tenant, in, in, in the rights that they currently have, what's going to make them involved in the rights that we then provide? You, you know, I mean, you're, you're talking about if we put on the website what, their, what the current rights are and the people don't feel comfortable dealing with that, what, what makes you think that they're going to feel more comfortable dealing with stuff that the city enacts? Because it's, it's still stuff they have to address. It's not like it's automatic. The ordinance w will, will be addressing the landlords and the tenants and addressing those issues so that egregious things don't happen. That's the idea. I mean, you're always going to have somebody who, who breaks the law, somebody who just ignores everything and sneakily goes around and does bad stuff. That's not the community I'm addressing. And I don't know how large the community I'm talking about is, which is why you know we spoke earlier about getting that information. Okay. So. Jill, it looks like you have something on your mind. Thank you, Mayor. I, I do. I just want to, um, I want to circle back on one um, a little comment that's hanging in the room on ADUs, and then um, have a few uh, sum up notes that Sarah and I would like to pose to you, and just get your feedback on them. Um, the ADU comment, I, I think uh, Tim has left. Um, the city's ordinance did not change with respect to the owner occupancy requirement but that left the comment left the impression that the um the owner of the property has to live in the house and that is not that's not right the owner has flexibility the owner can also live in the accessory dwelling unit so that has not changed from before and i just wanted to to make sure that was clear uh, just to play devil's advocate i think tim was talking about no nobody Live, uh, the yeah. owner uh, not living in the house and his tenant. Uh, yeah, and we're, we are um, actually um, uh, getting entitlements on several applications from that are coming through from, from what you heard about all of Tim's work. So it, we'll, we'll be able to report quite a bit about ADUs to you in about six months, I think. Um, we hear a theme on a couple um, kind of lower hanging through fruit items to um, we're, we're intrigued about the renter's insurance idea and we really appreciated hearing about that tonight so we'll we'll learn more about that um, quickly and mediation um, we we didn't hear controversy about this we don't think it's would be very expensive to do and it's something that we believe that is readily available to us. I've, I've spoke to two different groups that provide mediation, including Project Sentinel. So um, we will proceed with that and absent data, those two things um, still seem uh, doable and a short period of time to get information back to you and possibly even um, more from that. I'd like to also note, uh, we heard about resources, making sure folks know what's available to them. Uh, for the second community conversation about housing, I do want to note we, we created our own resource guide. It's in English and Spanish. It is coast side specific. San Mateo County has an amazing resource guide, but it's about that thick. And so what we did was really strip it down to the most local, most pertinent resources. And um, uh, Victor uh, Gatan out of uh, the city manager's office did all of the translation. It's on the web. If it's not available enough, we'll try to heighten its access. And we have copies, and I, I think we put copies in the library and other places. So we'll, we'll work on that. We agree with um, having information like that readily available. We've put time into doing that. 
Um, so data and outreach, that's going to take us some time. And uh, I'm going to need some, some help. Our, my staff is maxed out. And so we're, we're going to explore that. I'll work with the city manager. We've, we've been main brainstorming on, and we heard the, the good intern idea, and there's, there's other thoughts that we yeah, have. Get the help you need one way or the other. Cool. Okay. <laughs> and, and can we talk Everybody about heard yeah. that? Yeah. No. <laughs> can, we, can we talk about that during our retreat? Because I think yeah. that we need yeah. we, we do need to prioritize what we're yeah. focused on very much, okay. and we can't overextend into every single area. So we have to be very conscious about where we're putting our time and energy. Yeah. Okay. So that was my list. Thank you it, for letting me. As I mentioned, though, I think it's important to understand the landscape as part of our LCP update. I think it's important information, regardless of what we do, is to understand our community. So I, I, I would support having somebody on board to, to look at that. So. so is there any other direction you need from us, Jill? Um, two things. Um, we're wondering if you want us to come back with a draft mediation ordinance, just narrow, limited to that. I, I think we should do some outreach first, though. We don't, we don't want to surprise folks with a first reading on something. Um, but we could, that is something we can prepare fairly quickly. I'm hearing that you, you'd like to address housing concerns soon. Um, we're, we were seeing that maybe this is a, a way to provide some phasing in. Um, and then I, I do, I need to know, it isn't that we haven't done a bunch of research? We, we suspect that most of our um, properties that are in uh, rental um, mode of, of tenancy are probably smaller. Uh, those larger ones that were listed are all deed-restricted affordable housing developments. And we would agree with that, and this is some of the research we've been doing. Um, so we're expecting you to see that profile. And we have more work to do, and um, I'd like to kind of uh, clean up some of the data that we've collected. Okay. So, so you're suggesting more or less that most of them are going to be mom and pops? A, a lot of them seem to be, but we, we want to learn more from these folks. They, they can inform us better as well. Yeah. And we want to understand what mom and pop means, too. That's, so that's important. Right on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for this. With everything you've got going, thank you for this. Appreciate it. We wish we could clone you, uh, Joe. Uh, moving on to appointments to city commissions. Um, is there a staff report, or do we just make those uh, appointments? Yeah, so as a follow-up to the November election with the... Um, uh, excuse me, uh, Jessica. Could we have a five-minute break? We need a, a little clarification.
We are trying to fill uh, vacancies in two city commissions, the Planning Commission and the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, so so uh, let me uh, ask the uh, council members for their recommendations for uh, uh, Planning Commission. Um, what's that? Each of us ought to mention whether we're going to reappoint yeah, yeah. or appoint a new yeah, person. Yeah, 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 yeah. So why don't we do planning and each of us go through. Is that what I'm doing? Yeah, that's what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. like okay. Robert, you have a, uh, an appointment for the planning commission. Thank you, I do. Um, I am delighted to recommend the appointment of Sarah Polgar to our planning commission. Um, Sarah here? Yeah, Sarah she's here. She's left. No, she's here. Oh, she's here? <laughs> Where is she? I don't, I don't see. Oh, she's on the way back. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, ha have a second for Sarah Polgar? I'll second. Um, okay, all right. Deborah? Your planning commission appointment? Yes, I'd like to appoint Stephen Ruddock. Before we vote on that, I think Debbie is going to want to recuse herself. She said we're going to vote. You're going to vote? Oh, so okay. Okay. Um, fine. I would like to reappoint uh, Jimmy Benjamin to the planning commission. I would like to reappoint Brian Holt. I would like to reappoint Rick Hernandez. So, uh, I think, no, no apparently we're going to vote at the very end, is what Jessica said. Okay. Um, do I hear a motion for the planning commissioners that we just mentioned? I move that we approve all of the appointed um, planning commissioners, with the exception of Stephen Ruddock right now. We'll discuss it, we'll do Stephen next. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, I move that um, we appoint Stephen Ruddock. And I'm going to recuse myself from this vote because of my relationship with this person. Need a second. I second. Thank you. Let me leave her alone. She likes Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, we, uh, I second. Robert, do you have a... No, we already, we already appointed. We're doing Reddick. Uh, Stephen Ruddick. Oh, okay. Um, all those in favor of Stephen Ruddick? Aye. 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 Get her back in. Uh, we're now ready to uh, fill the vacancies on the uh, Parks and Rec Commission. Robert? I would like to recommend the appointment of Pat Patricia Black, also known as Pat Black. I would like to renominate Paulette Eisen. I would like to renominate Ellen Clark. I would like To re-nominate my person. <laughs> I just blanked. <laughs> I'll get it in a second. I got thrown off by my mom. I would like to appoint Evelyn Erickson. Um, 
I second um, all these uh, appointments. Can we have a vote? All in favor of the Parks and Rec appointments that we just heard? Aye. 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 Uh, the last item on the agenda, I have to do him. Oh. Not do him. Yeah, let's do that next time. Okay, go ahead. I'd like to re-nominate Amy's All House. I'll second. All in favor of Amy? Aye. 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 Amy's appointed. Do we have a five minute Oh, is that right? I think we're finally ready for the last item on the agenda, which is the Half Moon Bay voter results on state propositions. Um. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members, members of the public. It was asked that staff place an item on the agenda for the Council to discuss the way that Half Moon Bay voters voted on the state propositions and have an opportunity to direct staff um, to bring back any information necessary. So I'll quickly go over the results. For the most part, the Half Moon Bay voters were pretty much in line with the state. The one that was opposite was Proposition 3. Half Moon Bay voters did vote to pass that proposition, but it did fail at the state level. The Proposition 6, Half Moon Bay voters overwhelmingly voted to um, keep the gas tax. So, and then again with the last three, they were all pretty much in line with the state results. So with that, I will defer to the council for any discussion. I asked the city clerk to um, compile this information because we've had a historic election. We had a 79% voter turnout. So we have a chance here to actually, you know, look at what the majority of voters think about some very important subjects and what they're willing to, you know, spend money on or not. I thought this was, you know, really interesting information. And uh, because we've been talking about housing, I just wanted to point out that um, the overwhelming majority of voters favor housing construction for um, underserved communities, you know, veterans, um, mentally ill. They're, so they're, they understand the need for us to, to shelter residents in our community. They rejected Prop 10, which was to um, basically to repeal Costa Hawkins and allow cities much more flexibility in imposing rent control. So they are concerned about rent control. So if you know the council were to proceed with rent control, um, you have to imagine that the landlord or real estate community, if we didn't put something on the ballot, they would. And we know right now we have 58% of voters, you know, rejecting, um, making it easier to do rent control. So I, I think that's an important data point as, as we move forward. And I actually think it, it shows, it, it supports what the council is doing. You know, we're moving forward with an LCP update that has significant amounts of new housing, you know, better located where there's services and fewer impacts on transportation. Um, we've been having discussions about affordable housing. So we're kind of in sync with the voters, but we just need to be, I think, cognizant, especially on the rent control issue where our voters came down. So, but I was pleased to see that we have a progressive community, uh, clearly progressive. They, they supported the water bonds, which was a significant, um, bond of, you know, more than $7 billion. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of community we're, we're dealing with. I thought it was pretty exciting. So um, that's why I asked her to, to find that information. I didn't know this is what we would find, but 
um, I, I thought we should benefit from that information tied in with the voter turnout. So. Thank you for asking, Debbie, and thank you, staff, for compiling it for us. It's wonderful. They want free range. <laughs> they like free range, our community. That's, that's good. Now we just need to make our children a little more free range. Are there any uh, future uh, possible agenda items that we want to bring up now? Yeah. <laughs> I wish the realtor community was still here. I'm a socialist. I'd like to um, add, have on the agenda a discussion of increasing the minimum wage in the town of Half Moon Bay. Uh, I agree with that. I have some resources on that too. I, I think that's a, especially if, you know, because of our housing situation and because I know that a lot of businesses in town can't recruit workers, um, I think we ought to take a look at that. Um, I had something else in mind too, but now I can't think of it. But I think certainly the, the minimum wage would be, uh, Robert? I have one thing to ask you. Oh, on, on this issue, on this. yeah, I just want to, read something very short. If I can find it. Okay. Here it is. It's all the way at the top. A recent Bloomberg piece about Seattle shows that employment in food service has actually increased since the minimum wage became $15 an hour in the beginning of 2018. The first study to examine the impacts of raising wages over $10 an hour in six cities found more money going to low-wage workers and no significant job loss. Economists have found raising the minimum wage would have other benefits as well, raising job retention, economic stimulus with more people having more money to spend, and reducing the number of working people relying on government assistance. And a growing number of small business owners say they want a higher minimum wage. When cities and states have raised it, peer-reviewed studies have found that they did not cause job losses argues economist David Cooper of the Nonpartisan Economic Policy Institute. There has been an enormous body of research on the effect of the minimum wage on employment, particularly since the mid-1990s, including recently by the Census Bureau, which has largely concluded that raising the minimum wage does exactly what it's supposed to do, raising the pay of low-wage workers with little impact on their employment. Most workers saw clear wage gains. Some ended up with the same amount of income for fewer hours of work. So, something worth discussing. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, again, this is a, an item that requires a lot of outreach and staff time. So I think this is something we should actually maybe bring back as part of our strategic planning session. Because again, it requires prioritization of. Uh, I agree with that. Resources. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I would like to add to a agenda as soon as possible. Um, we've talked about reincarnating re um, architectural review board, and it felt like there was pretty good consensus. And I think there's already good people out there to select from and would be a terrific uh, resource for planning commission in the city. Yeah, I, I, think, um, I think Jill and community development are already sort of compiling that information, because yeah. I think we directed that last year. So that will be coming, I believe. Yeah, okay. yeah. great. Any city council reports? I took Bob on a, on a biking tour, the new city manager on a biking tour through Half Moon Bay. 
Uh, it, was, it was good. We, we covered about uh, a tenth of the things that I wanted to cover because <laughs> there's so much to actually see on bike. But uh, I thought it was very useful use of time and uh, I'm excited to engage in a few more. I would think it would be politic of you to wear a helmet the next time you get your photograph taken, yeah. though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I went to the Mid-Coast Community Council as a liaison talking about what we're doing, and in return, the chairman of the MCC is going to be reporting monthly what they're doing so that there's more uh, synergy between the city and the mid-coast, I think we really need to find out what they're all about and vice versa. <clears throat> so um, I, I'm the city's representative on the City County Association of Governments. And uh, so over the last couple of months, we've had some um, very contentious meetings uh, over the Highway 101 managed lanes project. So this involves the construction of toll lanes um, and express bus lanes. And the question is who's going to own it and who's going to operate it. So uh, under state law, both the Transportation Authority and CCAG um, have to approve um, that, you know, solution, whatever it is. And the alternatives are to go with BAFA, Bay Area Infrastructure and Finance Authority, which is part of MTC, which is the, our regional you know, transportation planning agency, or um, the Valley Transportation Authority, which is um, controlled by the city of San Jose. Um, the TA voted to for San Mateo County to own and the VTA to operate by a vote of five to two. CCAG, a couple of weeks later, voted 11 to seven for the BEFA alternative. And so we had to appoint subcommittees of each agency to meet on January 2nd to try to hash through some of the details. And they brought it back to this most recent CCAG meeting last week. And everybody has basically dug down into their um, positions that they had before. So more information is going out and they've asked each of us to potentially bring it to our staffs to evaluate the information and potentially to the council but um, we would have to discuss it at the, um, I think, February 5th meeting because the C next CCAG meeting is right after that. So I would ask you maybe um, to delegate me to work on staff and refining my position. I was one of the ones who voted for uh, MTC and BEFA because um, San Jose is really not a regional agency. It's a, it's a city and BEFA has the authorities and the political muscle and the money to reduce our financial risk. A hybrid approach has come forward in recent days which would have allow San Mateo to own it and BEFA to manage it just like the other proposal that has the VTA managing it in San Mateo County owning it. The potential is there for millions in revenue but you know there's, there's a lot of things that could eat into that like the economy so um, we're working through the information and I, I talked to John Dowdy and about maybe you and I and John getting together and just going over this information and I would vote again in February. Um, so if you want to bring it back to a meeting in February, you can, otherwise um, I can work it out with staff and you can trust me to vote our best interest. You're trusted. <laughs> hmm? Right, so the, the CCAG meeting is um, February uh, 14th, Valentine's Day. Oh, fun. That's a good way to spend your Valentine's Day. Yeah, so if you trust me, you know, I'll work it out with staff and I'll... I'll I'm not persuaded about VTA yet. I'm, I still think we're on the right track, but... Trust. Trust. Okay. And then the other interesting thing that's going to be coming to the cities is... Um, under the leadership of Dave Pine and Congresswoman Jackie Speer, uh, the county is forming a, a new agency based on the current San Mateo County Flood Control Agency to handle sea level rise and erosion and those sorts of things. Basically, San Mateo County is the county most at risk from a 
a fiscal standpoint from the impacts of sea level rise, plus we have more vulnerable communities located in the, you know, the flooding zone. So the county wants to get ahead of it. There's the airport, there's like 10 sewer plants at risk, you know, there's all kinds of physical public assets at risk. So this agency would start getting a handle on that, and perhaps, you know, float bonds or, you know, levy taxes to help pay for whether it's levies or retreat or what have you. But they're going to be doing dog and pony shows to all the cities starting in February. And um, <clears throat> I saw a presentation last week and it, it looks really interesting. And it's pretty well thought out. And the technical person in charge of it is um, former council member and mayor Larry Patterson, who was my nemesis for many years. So I managed to grill him a little bit at this meeting last week. <laughs> we had a rendezvous. <laughs> anyway, it's an interesting idea, and uh, I hope you'll have a chance to hear about it soon. That's that. To a breakfast with our city manager, Bob Nisbet, and Debbie Reddick, right, um, that was um, held by Mark Berman. And he did a good job of kind of coming over, going over Gavin Newsom's budget and um, listening to city officials, uh, answering questions and discussing the budget. 